Today, I am glad to speak about guppies. I offer a few talks to the clubs. I always say, what do you want me to talk about? And usually they want puffers or something like that. And I was allowed to speak about guppies, which is my favorite fish in the world. But everyone goes like, oh, but puffers are so cool and all these things. But puffers don't have the ease and the color and all the cool things about guppies. And so it is my desert island fish. If I was stuck on a desert island, I would bring guppies even to eat. They would support me. I would eat them. I'd lose some weight, but I would enjoy them. And I could breed them and eat them if I really had to. So that's why it's my desert island fish. I can't do that with any of my other cool pets, but guppies are amazing. You know, just something like this, which this is a higher end strain you see here, but you know, you can, you can, you don't have to start here. You know, you don't have to start with a $50 two inch fish. You can start with almost anything and you can make this fish. And what I find impressive is that someone has spent a very long amount of time making this fish. And when I say that, this might be seven or 10 years of someone's life that you get to buy for about $50. And to me, that's amazing. And you can find all different parts of the world with different guppies and different things. And for a while, I went through a big phase where I was actually collecting what's called the heirloom strains. And that was all the stuff that would have been popular in the 70s and stuff like that. Way less color, but you got to see the evolution of guppies. And uh, so I just thought that was, you know, really cool. But the best thing about guppies, every color under the rainbow you can find in a guppy and uh, you get all kinds of different tail patterns. You can get, you know, things like this is half black because the fish is half black with, it's, well, it's a half black pastel because the color sheen on it would be pastel. And then you've got, you know, you can get bodies that are half black here and then you've got multicolor. You can get them with a little bit of metal color on their head. Anything you can dream up, it exists somewhere out there or someone's working on making it. And there's a million different tail patterns and all that. And the best part is, you can get a guppy anywhere. Wherever someone's selling fish, you can walk in and get a guppy, and you could make this fish. They all started from just, you know, a wild caught guppy, which you'll see some wild caught guppies. Not a lot, because people go, those aren't very colorful. But what I'd like to focus on the fancy, and I've seen lots of talks on guppies, and they usually focus on genetics and things like that. And uh, you don't see, you see a lot of graphs. And you see a lot of maps on where they came from and things like that and not a lot of pretty pictures and not a lot of real life experience with your own fish rooms and so like in my opinion this has built my business and that is guppies whether it's my online presence my store i started with a couple of tanks i fell in love with guppies i started breeding them i was able to start selling them at a slight profit not a lot i wasn't getting rich instantly but that allowed me to buy another tank and pretty soon you got 50 tanks and you know how to run a fish room and then maybe you're crazy enough to start a fish store and you might get to speak in front of some people. But it all started with guppies and that's why I absolutely love them. Every color in the rainbow. I'm gonna cover a few little basics. Half of you in the room are going, oh, come on, we know this. And then the other half might not know because these questions are pulled from kind of my in-store experience and online where it's like people are asking all the time or they assume they know how to sex a library like the most often in my store they will say, well, yeah, it's the one with all the color. Well, in really high-end strains of guppy, the females can be more colorful than the males. And so that's not an accurate thing, but basically if we look at a male guppy, which this is the male here, it's gonna have a gonopodium. And they are a live bearer, much like humans are in other things. And so it uses its appendage to impregnate a female. And this here is a female. And instead of having a gonopodium right here, it has a triangle fin. So it makes that nice triangle shape. This does not have a triangle and it's anal fin. So that difference right there will sex out almost any live bearer for you when it comes to mollies, guppies, platies, sore tails. It won't do stingrays and some other things like goody -its. There are a few outliers, but if you can you know, start going into a store or something like that and you can identify that triangle fin versus a fin that looks like a stick, you can sex almost any live bearer and uh, you'll look like you know a whole lot and it'll be a lot better when you buy three guppies and you don't come home with two males and one girl you come home with the right trio and get started the right way so i want to cover that because you know you never know if there's a 12 year old in the audience they've never seen guppies before and even me like maybe i was 20 something i didn't know how to sex guppies yet you know you buy them they make more if you buy enough of them but maybe you didn't know oh i could just buy a couple and make that happen 
So I love them, they're easy to breed. That's actually what got me into this hobby. It wasn't guppies, which I wish it was. The first thing that I ever bred for me was a molly, which it's like a sister species to a guppy, and it can actually crossbreed with guppies, and you make muppies or gollies as they're called, <laughs> you know, which on a side tangent, those are all sterile. I've yet to ever meet anyone, because this is always the question that comes up like after a talk or something like, wait, I heard a guy's got those and he said they weren't sterile. I've yet to ever meet anyone that has muppies or gollies that will still reproduce. The genes should make them sterile so that you can't keep that line going. And that's why we never see them in the hobby. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I've just yet to ever meet someone and I've seen them, but I've never seen them be able to get fry from them. And I'm super interested in them because they look like freaks of nature. You know, you see this gup, or you see a molly, you know, it's like a black molly with this crazy big tail because it like, you know, the tail gets ginormous. So it's guppy tail, but four inch molly size. So it's just like on steroids and it looks crazy, but they always die out. And so, you know, I've, I've got, you know, like, oh, if you ever find them, I got big money to get them. And it's like, I don't think they actually, I think it's just lethal genes, but Guppies themselves, easy to breed because they are a library. You don't have to wait for them to lay eggs or anything like that. They, the females get impregnated and 28 to 35 days later, they're gonna release fry that look basically like this, miniature versions of the adults. Now, if we make some minor changes to our aquarium, we should be able to raise most of them. Uh, maybe a little bit like in this tank, we've got some live plants offering a little bit of cover. And if you, in your tank, put cover in one spot, fish are drawn to it. If your whole tank is covered, they won't be drawn to any one spot. And sometimes that can be useful in very advanced setups. Uh, like it used to be a popular thing, it's not anymore, but you would have like a, a pile of rocks and you put an airlift tube to a sponge filter in the center of that pile of rocks. Well, Fry would be like, oh man, there's the cover and they go swim right into it they get sucked into the airlift tube and it spit them out on the other side of a divider. So you always had your fry separated from the parents and the parents could never swim into that rock pile. And so that's actually how you can crank out an insane amount of fish if you ever wanted to. And that was common wisdom. There were some other ways to do it, but that airlift system was very, very efficient. But for the average person at home, let's just use some plants because they're gonna clean the tank for you anyway. And it's autopilot. And you only have to have, if a male and a female get together, even for just like a day, she will give birth every 30 days for the rest of her life, even if she never sees another male again. And so that gets a little bit into, you know, a little bit harder if you're trying to make specific strains and like, you know, that first guppy we saw, you have to take the babies, never let it see another male and then pair it up with the fish you like. Cause if she gets impregnated, it, I guess, down breeds what you're trying to do. It doesn't replace all the DNA in there. You can still introduce another male, but uh, it's gonna really drop your ratios of the male you do want. So if you can split them up fast enough and they don't really sex out, you know, you're seeing here, like they really don't even have fins yet. Uh, till about six, seven, eight weeks, depending on how hot you're keeping them and how much you're feeding them and things like that. What size rocks do you use in So I like to use uh, oh, and I forgot to start my talk, by the way, with ask me tons of questions. That makes the talk way easier, and I want to answer what you guys actually want to know, uh, but I like to use like, like a Mexican beach stone or something about three inches around, and the way you stack them should make about half inch, three quarter pockets. And you just stack them loosely so that an adult clearly wouldn't like worm itself in there without getting stuck, but the fry can just navigate through it like a cave system and eventually they just go, hey, what's down here? And they go, woo, onto the other side. And uh, it works really, really well for things like sword tails and stuff like that that really want to eat their fry, goodyids. Like there's some things that, you know, just really chase down their own fry. Guppies, only if they're really hungry. If you keep them well fed, eh, I'm a little too lazy to chase you today. But if I'm hungry tomorrow, I will chase you. So, uh, but yeah, that tactic is really cool because you just get to go into your fish room and you just grab your net every day and you could move them to an entirely different tank, and uh, it's a really efficient system, so. But water conditions, hard water. I don't, like I've heard, some of you guys have really hard water, some of you've got reasonably soft water. Where I'm from, it's literally RO water on the tap, 23 TDS, there's no hardness, pH is 6.8. It could not kill guppies faster. Like I have the worst water, and I love live bears, and so I have to do a lot, and so what I do, 
I run crushed coral in every single one of my aquariums in my store, at my fish room, and I run one pound per 10 gallons of water sprinkled into the gravel. Over time, that will keep your pH roughly 7.4, 7.6, somewhere in there. If your water's already there, you're happy. Uh, and then we wanna add minerals back to this water. Now, crushed coral will do that a little bit. It's got a little bit of calcium, but we really wanna use something like a, a Wonder Shell or Equilibrium, or you can even use chalk that has no additives. Like that's usually got a lot of calcium in it, but if it's got an additive, it's toxic. But we need to add calcium to water. Why? Because something like these females right here, if they're cranking out fry all the time, they have to use minerals out of their body to make new lives. And if they're not replacing that calcium, the calcium, that's where you will start getting a lot of humpbacks and stuff like that in your elderly guppies is when they lack calcium for a long time, they start getting you know curved spines. There can be some genetic issues too with that, but the most common is the hard water and uh, we'll talk about some of the live bear diseases and why hard water is going to help you combat that anyway. Uh, but these right here, these are called the koi guppy. And uh, the females, this isn't even a good female. The females can be much more colorful. And they've actually got to the point now. I, haven't, I have koi guppies, but I don't have the good koi guppies. The females will actually have a wen growth, like on a Aranda goldfish. They're literally giving that head growth now. And so it's crazy that we've moved on from colors and size and fin shape. Now we can start like building on body parts essentially. That's what this hobby has become with this fish. And then you've got, you know, a couple of males over here. They're just full of color and this is a dark shot of them. But if you had, you know, 30, 40 of those in your planted tank or whatever, it's just gonna look amazing even from across the room. And they're making more for you. And you might go, well, yeah, they're having babies and I can sell these at $20 a pair and people want to get them. And so that really can fund, you know, your African cichlids, your next aquarium. Even if you don't absolutely love them, they are a great moneymaker. So the difference between a guppy and an endler, today if you go to a pet store, is gonna be something like this. You've got a fish that looks a lot like a wild caught guppy and then it has black dots, some specks of color, like there's a little bit of blue or purple, a little bit of orange, and a little bit of green. Usually there's some dots on it. This is a little bit line bred. It's a, called a black bar endler, and it's got that you know one little uh, bottom sword tail on it. And then today your tr traditional guppy is going to be maybe something like this, where it's got lots of color, but essentially it would have looked something like this. And we've molded it into everything you've seen so far. All those different colors. Eventually you can trace back to something in here. And even the colors you can't trace back, you mix colors and genetics make those colors. And uh, so the endler itself is a different species than guppies. And today we're only talking about the normal fancy guppy. There's lots of other guppies like the Picta guppy and there's lots of Micropacilia that technically are guppies as well. If people like, you know, real guppy nerds would be like, well, actually there's this too. But for all intents and purposes, the way you could walk into a store and buy, you could buy these where a lot of those other things, they're so fragile and they really want brackish water that you know, I'm probably negative $700 on those things and I still kill them. And I talked to other like crazy advanced breeders like I got them to live for seven weeks one time. Like I got, I got fry and I got them as long as I kept them brackish. And the minute I lowered that salinity, they died off. So it's, you know, this isn't the easiest fish. And we'll, we'll talk about why they're not crazy easy. Even though you hear, ah, guppies are for beginners, blah, blah, blah. Like that used to be the way it was. Now we have, technology has evolved so much that your average person that just wants to own an aquarium and throw some guppies in there might struggle with it where they used to be, oh yeah, we cycle tanks, they're bulletproof, you couldn't kill them. We're so far away from the wild caught guppy that they're fragile little beings now, so. So the tank set up, this is uh, kind of a cool tank at my store. It doesn't look like it from this shot, but these are just assorted guppies. So even this big delta tail here, you know, kind of looks like a D, right? Uh, lots of plants, lots of hidey holes. You can see there's uh, orange shrimp and stuff like that. What you don't see on the screen is the puffer fish that's this big. It's a species of puffer that can live with it. Um, but you can set up your tank with any tank mates that aren't really gonna be big fin nippers and realize that every fish has a mouth and fish put things in their mouth. So everything will eat baby guppies, even guppies. Even, you know, so if you've got a really fast 
Like, so I put in two Siamese algae eaters. This is a 360 gallon aquarium. Two Siamese algae eaters. Never saw a baby again until I got them back out because they would just snipe them down. They were way faster, even though we had auto feeders, we're dumping food in and the puffers eating a ton. So you got to pick your tank mates carefully. Uh, lots of tetras, rasboras, um, you know, even corydoras, things like that. We talked about kind of some of the breeding setups. We talked about substrate, but really have fun with it. It doesn't have to be a planet tank. Could be fake plants, could be castles, could be SpongeBob theme. They don't really care so long as there's a little bit of something in there. And to be fair, in Thailand and things like that, we're raising them in vats. They get no decor at all. They could live in just a bare bottom aquarium and they will live, but do something that you will enjoy looking at. And if it's a pile of rocks, if it's a SpongeBob castle, if it's live plants, if it's inside your cichlid's mouth, wherever it needs to go. I mean, let's, let's be real here. <clears throat> so this slide taunts me because I know everyone's looking at it going, oh God, we're gonna hear about temperature. Like, yeah, they're guppies, tropical fish. But it's only here to remind me that the closer you get to wild, you can keep them down in the 50s and 60 degrees. So that's why an Endler live bear, which is not a guppy, can go so much colder than a guppy can today because we've line bred them so far away from being wild that they no longer handle it. And why is that? Because most of the guppies we're getting nowadays in our stores uh, are coming from Florida, which is pretty hot, or maybe Ohio, because it's pretty hot here too, but. <laughs> Uh, and then also Thailand, Sri Lanka, places like that where they can basically use free heat year-round outside <clears throat> and the guppies we're getting, something like this, will have never seen a day in their life under 80 degrees, ever, for the last 30 generations. And so we took a fish that could live in the 60s and now under about 72 it starts falling apart and that's quite a bit different uh, and it used to be back when it was people like us breeding guppies instead of we had big farms doing it mostly we would keep them in unheated aquariums in the 70s you know heaters basically fried fish they weren't as good and we were scared of heaters and so we'd run them at room temperature and that made them a lot hardier because they could all of a sudden withstand 65 degrees to 85 and so you could just throw them in a tank they'd do well throw them in a bowl didn't matter they did okay and now you sneeze in front of the tank, you're like, I think it's getting Nick, I think it's, I think it's getting Finrot. And so that's, you know, the optimal temperature for a guppy you're gonna buy at a store, in my opinion, this day and age is about 80 degrees. And it's just because where they're coming from, that's the temperature or hotter they're gonna be acclimated to. And you can, you know, use time and get generations in your water and you can cool them down. Like I've got guppies that uh, I had outside and when it gets cold, Yes, I do let some of them die off. This was a process I used to do. And when, let's say, I, I let them get down to 70 degrees. Then next year, so I bring them inside. Next year, I put them back outside again. And then you go through the whole summer, and then you let them get down to 68. The ones that died at 70 are removing themselves from the gene pool, and the ones that can handle it are going to 68. Next year, you go to that, and that's how you can get it back to get a guppy that can go that whole spread, unfortunately. No one has any value in that anymore. It used to be that you had the Stan Shubles, the Luke Robux. People would attach their name to the guppy. And so, you know, if this was a, an aquarium co-op Red Delta, you would want to make sure that it was really hardy because, oh yeah, all aquarium co-op fish, they always die. That would be horrible for your reputation. So you had to do a lot of stress testing on those guppies so that anyone could be successful. <coughs> So how many for your aquarium? One of the most asked questions, and it's the question you can't really answer. What's your skill level? You know, are you running live plants? What strain are you even running? Like an albino strain of a guppy is typically way weaker because their vision's worse and things like that than a non-albino strain. So my recommendation becomes pick your size of aquarium you want to keep. Maybe that's a 20 gallon, maybe it's a five gallon. I wouldn't go less than five but the more water you have, the better. And then get yourself maybe a trio, a boy and two girls, maybe it's a group of six, two boys and four females, so they don't run the females ragged. And let them populate, and your skill level will dictate how many fish you get to keep. And so, in some people's 55s, they might literally have five or 600 guppies in there. And for the next person, they might only have 22. 
because they don't change much water and they don't put enough food in and it's a self-regulating system. And if you're not putting enough food in, they'll naturally eat their own babies. So it will get to a point where there's more hungry mouths than there are babies in the system and uh, it will level out. Now I want to point one more thing out on this picture. This guppy right here has what's called the ribbon fin gene. So its pectoral fins are crazy long. This is also his gonopodium. It's actually so long he can no longer breed with females. So it becomes useless. It's very apparent in swordtail fish as well. And so this fish, you actually can't breed true. This fish is useless, looks great. You need one of his brothers or one of his sons or whatever it is that doesn't have the ribbon fin gene to breed with the female and about 25% will come out with these crazy long genes. They do okay in their class in the competitions and stuff, but for a home hobbyist, they look okay, but I wouldn't spend time doing it because most stores and things like that, you don't really get much more money for them at a store and you've got three quarters, you know, or, or at least a quarter of your stock that's kind of useless, so. Besides looking at, I mean, that's what I'm here for. I'm here to look at too, so I'm useless otherwise. So tank mates, some shrimp are a good one because they don't have really mouths to chase stuff down. Autosynclus never hurt a bone in anyone's body. They're so nice. Uh, Corydoras, I thought they were safe until I brought in a wild caught group of orange lasers and I put them with my red deltas and all guppy production stopped even though I never ever eat one. Uh, it just, it went on for months. I thought, well, maybe I did something wrong. Maybe my auto water change system, but it literally was, they would go after them when they would settle down at night and they would eat them. And I, so for a while I thought, I'm just not feeding enough. Then I went Captain Insano and I'm really overfeeding the tank and I'm really changing too much water. Still didn't make a difference. Uh, so pick your tank mates with small mouths and uh, make sure they're not too quick and make sure they're not sneaky like a Corydora apparently. And, uh, but I've seen everything done. I literally know people that have some in with African cichlids and I could never tell you like that's going to work. But now that I've seen it happen more than once, I can tell you any combination of fish can be done. It's all about odds. I would tell you you got like a 2% chance of that ever working. <laughs> but how, does, how, do, how do you find that out? Well, I was feeding, you know, the ones I didn't like to my cichlid tank and they stopped eating them and now they're reproducing <laughs> in there. That's how you find that out. So, you know, and actually things like guppies are one of my favorite tank mates for shell dwelling cichlids. They both want hard water, things like that. You get a taller aquarium and you can keep all your guppies up top and all your shell dwellers are going to be down low and they're going to be super duper territorial. If a guppy even looks down there, they're going to get chased. But all those fry, they give birth and they go, look at all those shells, that's cover, I should go down there. They feed the shell dwellers the best protein diet they've ever gotten and you can spawn some really rare shell dwellers quite easily because they're getting live <laughs> protein all the time. And so at that point, you're not keeping the guppy because you love it, you're, you're loving the shell dwelling fish. But I'm just saying, you can use them even with tank mates that don't make sense sometimes. They're a really versatile fish, in my opinion. So, do guppies need aquarium salt? The answer is yes, no, maybe. So when we breed a guppy in Sri Lanka, Thailand, stuff like that, uh, fresh drinking water comes at a premium. Like it's just, you, you, not all the time at the farm can you just turn on fresh water and it might be more expensive, there could be shortages, things like that. So they typically will use some ocean water. Ocean water is free, there's tons of it. So we can just pump that in, use that at the farm. And salt water also has good properties like high pH, lots of minerals in it. And when you run brackish water, there is very few, if any, diseases because so few people are doing it. And you get the added benefit that when you take a brackish water fish and you put it into fresh water for a week before you ship it to America to sell in our stores, if it did have anything wrong with it, the freshwater, you know, it's like doing a saltwater dip on a freshwater fish. All the parasites drop off, you ship it out, and in theory you've shipped a perfect fish out. The problem becomes their kidneys and their liver and that type of stuff starts failing when they hit our softer water. So like if they come to Washington, where they're gonna sit in a Pet Smart or a Petco and their whole system sharing water and there's nothing to buffer the water, they just start shutting down. And you're gonna see fish like this right here, where it's got some fin rot going on, all the fins are clamped. You can see this one a lot. This one's got some internal parasites, but it's all clamped up. 
And you may have seen this at a pet store before. It's all, you know, they call it live bear disease or live bear shimmy. There's a lot of, all these diseases get associated with live bears, even though all fish can have these things. But the one you typically, the telltale sign is you see a bunch of mollies. Mollies are notorious for this. They're all up in the corner, they're all clamped up, and they're just doing this move, rocking back and forth, trying not to die. And they are dying because organs are shutting down because the water has now gone way too soft or way too less minerals. And so even though that's the same problem we have in mollies, it is the same problem we have in guppies. And so when you ask like, should I use aquarium salt? Maybe, but I think it's way better just get the pH and get the minerals up a bunch and then you won't need it. So really the live bears need the minerals, not the salt, but a lot of times it goes hand in hand. Like you bring in that and it will bring minerals in, especially if you're using like a marine salt or something like that. And so there's been a lot of miscommunication over the years. You know, even so much so, you guys have probably heard people like, yeah, African cichlids are brackish water fish. Like, no, no, they like lots of minerals, but they don't have to have the actual salt itself. So, but fin rot, very, very common in guppies. They've got these big, long, flowy tails. They've been grown somewhere where they may have never seen bacteria before. There is some breeders that will use UV sterilizers. There's no gravel, and they literally have never seen bacteria. The fish is a perfect specimen in every regard, except you sneeze and you kill it. So very apparent. I use erythromycin or aquarium salt. So aquarium salt, you're like, well, why are we, we might need salt. It will treat that because enough salt will kill off freshwater bacteria. So it's, you know, chicken and the egg. Do guppies need salt or do salt fix the guppy? So, you know, but erythromycin will take care of, an antibiotic will take care of fin rot. And it's because when you ship them, they come in bags with three to three to six hundred of them in one bag that's about this big. And if I get in the car with Rob and we drive home and he's not sick, it's very unlikely I'll get sick. But if he is sick, I've got a reasonable chance of not getting sick if I keep my distance. When I get on the plane to fly home and there's 300 other people and we're all sharing the same air, if one of them's sick, it's much more likely I'm going to get sick. And that's that communicable disease. It only takes one of these guppies to really start getting stressed. One of them bites its tail, now bacteria is setting in, and I've had some pretty aggressive bacteria strains run through a bag of 600 guppies in about four hours. It literally, you can watch it eat the fish, and there's some strains of bacteria I've never been able to stop, and that's with full on salt water, bifurins also in the water, like I've tried, and some strains you can never get rid of, uh, but most of them are pretty easy with just erythromycin and stuff like that. Then you've got something like this, sunken in belly here, could be kidneys are failing over a long period of time, but a lot of times it's gonna be internal tapeworms and parasites. And it's because when you grab a bag of 600 fish, it lands at a wholesaler. Last week it had wild cardinal tetras. This week it's got uh, guppies in it. Guppies are opportunistic feeders. They'll eat anything. They go, look at that, some poop, I'll eat that. And they go and eat that. It's got eggs of parasites. So now they've got it growing in them. Typically you're only gonna see this six, seven months after you bought that fish, you're going, it looked fine when I bought it, I don't get it. I've never introduced anything and you'll think, you know, you won't know what it is, but it is parasites and it's consuming energy out of this fish. And so something like a general cure, which is prosequentinol and metronidazole, something like that can clean them out pretty easy, not invasive at all. Um, and I recommend that for everything because they almost 100% of the time are gonna have tapeworms. If you feed heavy enough, you might not ever notice it. You can just pile on the food and you'll never notice it. But in my opinion, any parasite that is affecting a fish uh, will hold it back. And a lot of people wonder how I get my guppies so big because the females will literally be three and a half, four inches and just really round. The first step is making sure you're not sharing all the food with tapeworms. You know, let them in their growth period when they're young, put that body size on and not rob nutrients. So I deworm all of my guppies, even the ones I sell, and I would recommend most people do that too. Even if you're getting them from the guy down the street, nets transfer stuff, it's likely internal parasites are very common. And then this one right here is internal parasite, Camelanus red worm. It's like the hardest one to get rid of and uh, like general cure won't get rid of it. And it always presents itself with red worms poking out of the anus. It's really common in live bearers uh, just because they lay eggs in the poop, the poop goes down, more guppies eat it, they get shared around, yeah, have a scoop of my guppies, and pretty soon it's taken out a whole town. 
Uh, the eggs themselves will live for quite a long time in the gravel, so it can spread around a fish store pretty easy. And so much so that when I buy, let's say, guppies on Aquabid, almost every time they have it at this point. And you don't see it right away, because if you were to like, if, if the fish moves, all these retract up inside it like instantly. Like they're just, you know, triggered, boom, they're gone. So you have to use flubendazole or, well, fenbendazole, flubendazole, or levamisole. They're all kind of dog and goat dewormers and things like that. And you gotta do a little bit of research on how to use them. But once you get clean guppies, they're so easy, they get so big. And all of these things, you know, basically guppies not doing well. Yeah, they got live bird disease and they all died. Well, that's, live bird disease is gonna be one of these things. Most people just go, yeah, they died, I don't know. They weren't paying enough attention. Yeah, they just were on the downhill. I had a bunch and then I didn't, you know, two months later. And they're a cheap fish, like, you know, these are just assorted guppies, so most people go, yeah, they were two to four dollars, and they're just not around anymore, you know, and they go, I'll buy more. But really, you should be able to have a thriving colony that will, you know, feed everyone on your desert island forever. <laughs> so, as I said, the generic, you know, kind of a fancy guppy here, got a boy and a girl. They're as cheap as two dollars. At my store, I sell them for four, because I, I actually put a lot of medicine through them to get them healthy before I sell them. And, uh, you know, we mix quite a, quite a few cool strains in with ours as well. So I'm the expensive guy, whereas $2, you might wonder, like, can you make a profit and actually keep these things healthy before you sell them to me at only $2? So it's not always price equals quality, but it can give you a hint. And definitely, if you're buying fish, I would ask, like, what do you do when you quarantine these? Like, what water parameters are you keeping them in? And if they just spout something, like, completely generic, then they're not that in tune with their live bearers and that might be a worrying thing because anyone that's really into live bearers is like, oh, well, I'm doing this to buffer it up, I'm giving them calcium, I'm doing these things. Uh, but for a lot of pet stores, you know, you're in, you know, African Cichlid Central and you're like, yeah, some guppies, like there's some, over there somewhere, yeah, on that row, I think, you know. And they've got them at kids level, even though I got to squat down and look at them and go, I need that one right there and they're eye rolling as I need that exact one, but it's got the pattern I want. Then you've got something that's been line bred this will get sold as maybe a pink flamingo or just a, a red delta, even though it's not really much of a delta tail yet. It's a younger uh, fish. And if you had your heart set on this and you jumped on Aquabid, you might pay 50 bucks for a pair or a trio with shipping. And if you were in my store, all the fancy guppies that I breed, no matter what the strain is, however much I paid, uh, I sell them for $18.99 a pair. And some of the guppies I'm paying 50 or more dollars a piece for. With minimum, I gotta buy six or more. And so, but they still get sold out as $18.99 a pair because I want to grow that hobby because I want other library nerds around me. And, but it's a slow, slow army I'm building. So that's why I, I have to scour the country and try to convince people these are magical fish. <laughs> I really do love them. And most people, I would say most people I interact with, they go, ah, I don't do guppies. Those are beginner fish. Most people that have done like a guppy tank and really bred them can see the merit of like why it's the most popular fish in the world. In other countries, these are very, very popular. In America, ah, you know, I, I do this or I do that. I'm a trophy specialist. I do this, you know, and, you know, whereas if you were a guppy specialist in another country, they're like, oh, wow. You know, that's like being, oh, you're a better judge. Like, you're, there's prestige in other countries where here, ah, yeah, it's guppies. Yeah, I know. They, they carry those things. Kids section. <laughs> <laughs> so breeding for profit, in my opinion, these are the best fish to breed for profit because you can do it in such little space and you can make ridiculous amounts of money sometimes when you're close to the first to market. So what happens is you might be breeding this strain and people are going nuts for them and you start selling them. Like let's say you get your first batch. You've got 30 of these things now where you could get as many as 400. But let's say you raise 30 of them up and you're selling them in pairs and you sell 15 pairs, five go to the club, five go to a fish store, and five more to different people on Facebook. Well, in about three or four months, every single one of those person have now bred all those and they're competing with you. So to really make some money on guppies, if you're the guy that spent you know, $400 and imported them from Thailand like I've done before, you wanna get a colony of like 500 of these things and you wanna hit the market all at once and sell to everyone that possibly wants these and get your 20 bucks a pair or 30 bucks a trio and you go, well, I sold 50 pairs and I brought in, you know, some real serious money and now you can buy three more strains from Thailand, kill two more and still not have lost money. You're going, all right, I'm breaking even, even though I'm addicted to these things. But you, 
you know, this I actually think is harder to make money because people are attracted to big numbers. Like I'm gonna be rich off this thing. You don't sell that many. We're only gonna sell 50 pairs. But the assorted guppy, every store you talk to is buying guppies every week because kids walk in and the way people buy is they go, ooh, I really like those. I'll take a pair of those. Ooh, I really like those. I'll take a pair of those too. But if I have 50 guppies up here and they're all a different color, different tail shape, different thing, you go, ooh, I don't own one like that. I need that one, I need that one, I need that one. They might only be four bucks a piece, but you might be buying 12 guppies that day. It's the same price and they've got a mixed tank and they're gonna come back a few weeks later to the store or whatnot and go, ooh, I need that one. Ooh, when'd you get that thing? I didn't seen that one yet. And so you can sell massive volume. In my experience with most fish, when you're trying to turn a little bit of a profit to fund your addiction of fish, usually you can make more than you can sell. And that's definitely, the more specialized you get, you're either gonna end up selling these for $3 and ruin the market, or you're gonna feed a lot of them to your cichlids. Whereas the other ones, you might only get 50 cents or a dollar from a pet store. And yeah, you can get a dollar, sometimes even a dollar 50 for a generic guppy from your local store because they have so many coming in from Singapore and Thailand, Sri Lanka, and they're just crashing so hard because you don't have the right water here. But when they've been raised in your water, they can go over there and live just fine because the water is so similar. They're not used to the hotter temperatures and all the minerals and all the things. So a smart store owner would rather pay $1.50 for a fish that will live and the customer will be happy than 50 cents out of uh, Florida or Sri Lanka that they lose half of them in the first week and then they're doing claims on the last half with all their customers and that's why a lot of people don't like guppies they die all the time they're problematic but they used to be really strong and then the hobby was really strong around guppies when we had them be strong but since we kill them off now no one wants them so types of guppies here's just you know <laughs> some we're scratching the surface of what's out there my favorite actually are uh, like the pin tail, the round tail, the spade tail. With them small tails, they can really get away from fish and you can keep them with a lot more stuff and they don't drag this big tail around. We actually have the ability to make that tail so big it can no longer get off the ground. It literally, if it stops swimming, lays there and it struggles and it can get off the ground and it falls back down. We can take things too far and we have in this hobby. And the reason why we do that as breeders is because that tail that at 12 months is so big they can no longer get off the ground, at four months when you want to sell it, looks amazing. And you're just being parasitic on the hobby, going, well, I'm getting great money now, even though I'm actually selling a bad fish later on. And we do the same thing with veil tail angelfish. A lot of the veil tail genes in angelfish get so long, they're detrimental to that fish, but you can sell that fish typically two to three weeks earlier as an angelfish breeder and that is all the difference between making a profit in a competitive environment and not. So kind of the same thing goes on with guppies. And then you've got things that, you know, they're not my cup of tea, but someone's loving them. This thing right here, the swallowtail gene. And what that is, is it just looks like it's been bitten up. Like it's got all these extended rays and some of them are even more extreme. And I don't get it. It's not, not for me, but people can go nuts over these things where it just looks like it's missing parts of it. And that's the, the true connoisseur. Oh my God, that's something I don't own yet. I don't think it necessarily looks good. I just don't own it yet. Go nuts for that. And then down here, you can see, you know, you can see that leer tail right here. You know, so that's gonna be right here, the double sword tail. And then you've got some of that rounder, a lot of color in that fish. You know, think of this, you know, it's right now it's a lowly guppy because we're talking about guppies, but imagine you had, you know, a cardinal tetra that could have a lot of color and be a live bear and make its own. So you only got to buy three of them and then pretty soon you got a school of 50 of them as opposed to paying a lot of money to do that. Uh, and then you can get, you know, just really cool patterns. You know, some of this, a lot of people start calling the Spanish dancer type tails because when they start fluttering, they look like Spanish dancers. Same with this uh, fish up here, the platinum half moon mosaic. And then you've got ribbon fins and all that, but you can literally find what you like and play with it and you can you can start mixing things like oh I want this fantail with ribbon fin gene and then I want to get that koi gene where I was getting that growth on the head and make it do that thing too you can make them as weird as you want and it's pretty fun to make your own guppies at least I think so because you get to say I made that so high-end guppies where are you gonna find them so kind of an interesting thing that tank that we how to set up a tank this is actually 
the same aquarium. So this is that 360 gallon tank. All these fish live in there. And uh, you know, they're just crossbreeding and making cool looking fish. Or at least I think they look cool because lots of color. Maybe not at this resolution on here, but they look really cool on my, on my screen they look cool. In my house, when no one else is around, they look cool. <laughs> but where do you find high-end guppies? Typically, you're gonna have to go on to maybe eBay, local clubs, search your fellow nerds out, or Aquabid. And not a lot of times are you going to be able to ever walk into a store and actually buy that fish. You might be able to buy like, like this one that's half black with a little bit of blue on it, something like this. You might be able to buy that in a store. But rarely are you going to be able to buy something like this without going to, you know, the American Lion Bear Association convention or, you know, a Lion Bear club. Or you go, oh man, Larry in the back, that guy's a total guppy nerd. He's got them all. You can go get them from that guy. But you're not going to be able to find them easy unless you go on Aquabid, and then you're going, oh my god, i got to ship these things in. And then you, you know, you're know, you going to pay a lot of money. They could die. They don't like your parameters. But once you start becoming a fan of guppies and become a nerd, us nerds start talking. You know who's got that. You know, So like we all banded together when we wanted to import the see-through guppy from Thailand. It was like the most magical thing ever. You basically have a guppy that you can see through, and you're going, yeah, so it's like a glass cat. What's so cool? You got to watch, like we, as, as nerds, we got to see what foods went through fastest and things like that. You could see the intestines, and then you got to watch the fry develop. So you got to know exactly, well, at what point do they develop eyes? What point are they doing this? And so it was so cool to be able to see that process and help us with all our other guppies. And so I remember I paid, and so it's like a group buy of the, all the nerds, right? Like, we're going to bring it in. We're going to save ourselves some money. I paid $125. That was my portion for five fry that were, like, less than half an inch. And, you know, you were literally, like, just throwing money down a pit at that point. Uh, and then they grew up, and luckily, they were what they were supposed to be. Because sometimes that'll happen. You order fry, and they're like, yeah, just put fry in a bag. Like, they're not going to know for a couple of years. What are they going to do? You know? <laughs> uh, so luckily, they were that. But... If you can all, like, a lot of times people go in together and they're all going to order from all Thailand fancy guppies on Aquabin and stuff like that, or if you just Google it, ATFG, and you'll see lots of just jaw-dropping guppies. And if you can ship together, because what has to happen, they have to be shipped in to the country to a transshipper. Someone's got to receive it and open it up and go, yep, it's just guppies, lame. Close the box, reship it to one of us. And that's so you got to pay shipping twice already. And if you can split that up over multiple people, because the reality is you're going to drop $300 and the package is going to show up at your house is like this big, you know. And the shipping was like, what, it was $127? Well, we had to ship it twice and it was overnighted a couple of times and it came from halfway across the world. And so if you can, get, if you can coax one other nutbag in the room to go in with you, that got way cheaper, you know. And then when you both raise them up, you're going, hey, you want to trade? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so really you're getting two for one. It's an amazing deal. So if you have any other questions, which I know I barely, well, I feel like I barely scratched the surface on guppies. If you're not into guppies, you're like, finally, it's over. But I, I could talk all night long, and I'm sure the guppy nerds, I'm self-proclaimed by the way, uh, will come up to me and be like, hey, let's get really stupid technical about this and really start talking about something. And I love to do that. But if you have any questions, honestly, just email me at storedaquariumcoop.com. I get back to you, well, right now, like... I wouldn't get back to you, but I always get back to you within an hour or two. And you can check me out on all kinds of platforms. I'm on my own website, I'm on YouTube, may have seen me, all these things. Uh, and we can talk, and that's my big thing, is that I basically try and make money so that I can actually further the hobby. And so that's why I stay true and I answer hundreds of emails every day, and I make videos, and I do these things, and I come out to speak to you guys so that I can actually try and help, because otherwise I'm just the guy going, yeah, the hobby back in my day used to be way better, and I'm not actually trying to make it better. So that's where I can honestly say, if you send me an email, and you haven't gotten a response in 48 hours, I legitimately have missed it. I will never knowingly skip an email. I, I could say like, oh, I don't have time to reply, which every once in a while, if you write like a 40-page report, I'm gonna like, hey, I need a day off to digest this before we get into it. Because I've gotten emails where, they're really long, there's pictures, there's videos. Like it's, you know, I gotta read an essay before I'm like, oh cool, yeah, you had babies, sweet. You know, like that's really what it comes down to. It's like, oh yeah, cool, good job. Uh, but I will get back to you and that's very important to me. So hopefully uh, I can answer some more questions, especially if you have Q&A right now, ask, ask them and then I'll say, oh, I don't know that answer. But 
We can see. Anyone like guppies in the room? Two, three, all right, we're up to a few. Or do you have a problem with any of the females that are pregnant that they won't have the babies because they're in water that's too warm? So I haven't had it with them being too warm. I have had it be, so I, I never, I guess, I never associate the problem with one specific uh, other problem. So I know guppies won't have babies when they're stressed out. So for instance, if the water temp is way too high, they'll reabsorb their eggs a lot of times and then try again in 30 days when it may have cooled down. They will do the same thing for me in a lot of times in like a fry saver or a breeder net. You put them in a, you know, in a cage and then all the males are pestering them, it's stressful and they'll reabsorb instead of dropping. And so that's why I always let them drop in an aquarium, but I've never specifically had like just heat is doing this, usually it's stress. And I believe that all fish can handle one stress factor. After that, <laughs> it's really stressful. So, you know, you might have heat as a problem, but they might not be getting enough food, or there might be too many males chasing around. Like, there's enough going on that it just can't handle it anymore, and it decides to throw the towel in and go, hey, hopefully conditions get better by the next spawn. And lots of fish do that, not just guppies. You've got discus and angels, and they want to reabsorb all the nutrients and then try for a better time when it's less likely they're all gonna get eaten. So that's, that's nature taking its course going, okay, let's try at a better time. And I think that heat is a triggering that on top of another source. Cause you would say like, well, it seems like I have an 83 and they'll never breed again. Then you can go to a farm and you're like, all their guppies are always like 87. Like it's just hot, they're in ponds, you know? And so if you're way extreme, like you got up at 90 or something like, okay, maybe you could be so hot that they will go sterile at that point. But in most home aquariums, we don't hit those crazy extremes, so. Corey, yeah. I'm sorry, did I interrupt you? 76 temp is what he was saying. Yeah, yeah, anywhere between, in my opinion, 74 and 80, so long as it's relatively stable, if it's changing all the time, that's the one stress factor, you know, so you wouldn't want like poor water quality and, you know, temperature moving and pH moved a little bit. They can handle one thing. Yes. What are you feeding you? What do I feed my guppies? Oh, I should have built in like a sales pitch for all my foods or something. But no, I feed almost anything. Uh, some of my favorites are actually frozen foods and that would be frozen cyclops and frozen baby brine. Uh, for the adults, I like, you know, freeze dried blood worms. Frozen's fine too. Uh, and then I've got lots of fry foods and they'll eat, they're an opportunistic feeder, so they'll eat anything. But if I'm really trying to build a colony, I'll use something like rapashi food. So I can put it in a giant block, it stays water stable, and they'll literally eat for 48 hours straight, and I'll maximize what the guppies are getting. Now, in the guppy show scene, we can actually feed a guppy so much, it'll eat and its chest will explode. And so, if you're running in the circuits and you're trying to like win you know, your class, you can actually get what's called chesty males. Like, you've, you've power fed them so much that their, their front half the fish actually bulges out Kind of like, you know, breasts. And so that doesn't place because it means you tried so hard, you've actually made that fish worse, trying so hard to grow it. And we know that if you can push them much past that, it literally just crack open. Like it literally the skin can't grow as fast as we're feeding them and they can literally split open. So uh, how often should they feed? I, in a perfect, perfect world, they would have a small meal every two hours. But in a, in a real world, like a lot of my tanks will have like an Eheim auto feeder feeds three or four times a day, very small amounts. And then if I'm not out speaking, I would be feeding a frozen food in the morning and one at night. And you know, if it's a tank with a hundred guppies, I might only put like one cube of each thing in, but you want them to eat lots of small meals frequently, not just big meals, because your goal is if I eat every two hours, I won't be so, I won't get hangry and hate my family, you know? I will just be like, oh yeah, it's all right. But if I get a big breakfast, by the time it's 10 o'clock at night, I'm ready to murder someone for a cheeseburger. And so if you spread that out, it's a lot easier. And most fish in general purge their contents in their stomach about every two hours or so. And so, you know, if we were getting real sciency on it, 2% of their body weight over the course of a day yields maximum growth on most fish. Some catfish and stuff are a little bit different and then you want to split that up over all of the, the feedings, you know, but we don't really weigh 
you know, like, oh yeah, that one's 37 grams versus like, oh, it's a seven pound fish. It's a little easier to calculate the heavier they are, so you just guess. 2% does yep. that change with elevated flake food versus... Uh, I mean, I'm sure it does, but in the practical sense, well, so it gets a little weird. If you've ever looked at a package of like freeze-dried bloodworms versus frozen bloodworms, the frozen bloodworms will say 6% protein, uh, and then you'll look at freeze-dried and it'll say like a billion percent. And it's just because they're factoring in the water weight and they're not factoring the water weight. The, I think the reality is feed a decent diet and uh, you know roughly that 2%, which is more of like, oh yeah, I fed enough and I didn't crash the aquarium and they grew pretty good. If you were you know daily or weekly sampling your fish at the tilapia farm, you weigh them and go, okay, we're gonna adjust next week feed based on these 20 fish and you adjust all the auto feeders, that makes some sense. And then in something like that, you know, if you want to get that technical, you should be changing the diet. Like we've got a lot more amino acids and fats at the beginning of the fish when it's growing. And then we'd have a lot more of that for the females so they can build egg production. And then as they get older, we would transition into much more light vegetable matter and stuff like that. Cause they actually want to eat little bits of algae and you'll, you'll see that on your aquarium will grow some algae. Well, well, I never have, of course, but you might see that. And they'll go up and they'll, they'll bite on it and they'll just, you know, you'll see these little marks in the glass and that's them trying to scrape algae off like most fish will, really. So, anyone else with a question? Where can you get information about using these wormers? That is something I'm working on, but I would say that, in my opinion, for Levamisol, the best written guide would be from Greg Sage at Select Aquatics out of Colorado. You can read on his website, you can also buy it. It's a reliable dosage, the instructions are easy to handle. You can also hop onto a lot of the discus forums, but everyone's got, you know, it's, it's like asking like, okay, who's got the best cookie recipe? Well, you might have 10 great tasting cookies, but they're all slightly different. And who's the one that like, oh, actually, they thought their cookies were good, but they're not that good. You know, so you don't want to copy that recipe, uh, so. No <laughs> What's that, the no bakes? Yeah, yeah, make it so you can't, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make it so, uh, I'm using goat dewormer. Flubendazole is the liquid version of fenbendazole. And fenbendazole is a powder you mix in your dog food and it gets rid of all the worms and stuff like that. But the liquid version, it's much easier to control in an aquarium. You can go, oh, look at that. I'm gonna put one milliliter in per 10 gallons and it's gonna work as opposed to with the powder form. You're like, oh yeah, I need one tenth of one gram per 10 gallons after I crush it up and then it doesn't really want to dissolve in water, you want to use something like xylitol or something like that. And so it gets way too technical when I'm like, hey, just pour this in. Like people can understand that, but when you're like, okay, so I need to 10 equal portions and then we're gonna do this so it might dissolve into the water and we're gonna use boiling water to help dissolve it a little bit further, but don't let it get too hot or too cold because if this sits out in the wrong temperature, the medicine's actually gonna go bad. And so Greg Sage is who I would go to now for that dewormer. It's where I recommend he ships it out quick, which is good. And he will help you. If you send him an email and have a question, he will actually get back to you and help you through that problem. And there is a lot of other people that sell Levamisol and stuff like that, but uh, a lot of it is not stored temperature controlled, which it should be. You know, if it was sitting in a warehouse right now, it's too hot. The medicine's actually not gonna work anymore. And so it needs to be controlled temperature wise and it might be too hot to even ship right now, uh, but he can get fresh stuff and he ships it quickly and he'll insulate it if it needs to be insulated, things like that. And uh, that's where I go when I need it. And I've, I've tried lots of other stuff like, oh, I'm gonna save a bunch of money. I'm gonna buy pigeon dewormer on Amazon. Oh, it was a year expired, you know? And obviously someone's selling expired meds. I tried to claim with Amazon and I like take it up with the company, blah, blah. blah. Pretty soon you're not willing to fight for seven dollars anymore. You're like, okay, yeah, I, I get it, you know. Do you so. have an email address for that Greg Sage? Is it Greg Sage at? Uh, it's uh, selectaquatics at gmail.com, I think. I could ask me in a minute. I'll look it up in my email. I talk to him all the time. But yeah, it's, if you just go to selectaquatics.com, I'm sure there's like, oh yeah, you click the button and contact info. If you go to Aquavit or look under medications, there's a guy there who sells all sorts of stuff. Yeah, there's a lot of people who do that, and, and uh, Greg sells on Select Aquatics or sells on Aquabid under Select Aquatics sometimes, and he he's really into goodyids and sword tails, and he does a lot of actually cool things in my opinion, and he keeps some strains going and stuff like that, and uh, he's been a reliable source because I've I've had other people call the store and that type of thing, and they ask and they go, well, I found this other guy who's cheaper, and I go, yeah, I can't speak to him, and then they literally end up going with Greg Sage because they're like, well, it's been eight days, he still hasn't shipped. You know, and usually by the time you're noticing the worms, 
you, you're like, oh, because you've been losing some of your fish and you want to cure it sooner rather than later, mm-hmm. you know, and by the time they're really coming out of the anus and stuff, it's pretty progressed. Mm-hmm. So usually we'd be like, oh, we actually had them for six months, we just didn't know it. So. Tractors of fly carries it too. Yeah, yeah, well, and that's, I always forget that like in Seattle, like, oh, tractor <laughs> supply, like, we, you know, in the outskirts we have cattle and we have, you know, we have places you can buy stuff for horses and that kind of stuff, but. You know, when you're a city boy, like you don't you don't have access to that. So yes, you could totally go there, and it, it can be pretty darn cheap if you can just walk in. The problem is in really uh, you know urban areas, as I'm going to call it, Leva- or yeah, levamisole is also used to cut meth, so it's not the easiest to find. So that's part of the problem. There is. Yeah, so that's why, you know, it's not always easy to find, but yes, if you can find a good farm supply place and uh, make sure it's temperature controlled in there, because sometimes you walk in and you're like, oh, it's like 90 degrees in here. It's like, well, that medicine's not going to be that potent anymore. I was wondering why they asked for my driver's license. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, just like you want to go into, you know, Walgreens and you're like, I'd like some Sudafed, I have a cold. Let me, let me, let me take a DNA sample, let me do all that. I know what you're doing with this. I'm just trying, trying to get through a talk, that's all I swear. <laughs> Anyone else? All right, well, I think I'm sweaty enough to sit down at this point. It's getting out of control. <laughs> Thank you. All right, thanks, Corey. Hey, we'll take a little break here. Uh, Kim's got tickets up here for the raffle. I'll, I'll be selling 50 50s right here. There's. Uh,